Hello, and on behalf of the National Park Service, thank you for joining us today. I'm Ranger Ann, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today for Open House New York, we will be premiering a one hour and 10 minute video that highlights the struggle of the LGBTQ community before the Stonewall uprisings. It includes firsthand accounts of those who were at the uprisings in June of 1969 and the legacy that it created for the LGBTQ community here in New York City and across the world, including the establishment of the first LGBTQ civil rights site for the National Park Service, Stonewall National Monument, which was designated in 2016 by President Obama. We hope you enjoy this video and please check out our social media and website for more information and future programs. When I was 12, going on 13, uh, I got a haircut. My friends, these two butchers, took me and got a haircut. And it was a flat top, I guess you'd call it a crew cut today. And I went home and my father took one look at me. They also bought me boys pants, boys shirt, boys kicks. <laughs> And uh, I walked into the house and my father threw me out immediately. Uh, and I was 13. When I think about Greenwich Village in the 1950s, I think of my parents who spent time in the village with their artist friends. Um, my dad had been thrown out of graduate school for, for communist subversive activities. I'm not sure my father was ever, ever a communist, but Greenwich Village was a place where people who held liberal beliefs congregated. There were a lot of artists, a lot of gay people. Um, it was. For a long time, for a long time, Greenwich Village attracted um, um, beatniks, people on the cutting edge. And during the 1960s, this part of Greenwich Village, where I'm sitting now, became increasingly popular among young gay people. Um, there were bars. This park, in particular, was was a, a place where young people gathered, often young street kids, as I've called them, kids who had no real home to go to, kids who lived on the street. Well, Greenwich Village was a special place in New York. It was a place where everybody knew you could be accepted, uh, you could compliment people, you could be different. It was a place of freedom, fun, interesting people. And of course, a lot of gays came down here and had always a spot here somewhere, Washington Park or Christmas Street. By the time I got here in 66, it was Christmas Street. And it was just a Mecca for gay people, there were so many of us that you didn't have to worry about getting beat, like there's safety in numbers. And the vice squad couldn't operate because we knew what they looked like. And the community, you know, we'd, from one end of the block to the other end of the block, we'd tell you who was vice. So it was a very, very safe place to be. And Stonewall was in the heart of this, and thus it was so important to us. This was a place where street kids and their friends gathered in the evening and late into the evening and hung out in this park. So at the time that the Stonewall, the Stonewall Inn was raided, there would have been kids already on the street and other young people, other young gay people, walking up and down Christopher Street, checking each other out. In some ways, it was like the old fashioned, um, uh, as you see in movies on Main Street, where kids drive up and back in cars. And here it was people walking up and down the street, looking for, uh, looking to meet other people for sex principally, um, but also to hang out with their friends. You know, that we were sexual deviants, you know, society thought we were sexual de deviants. Uh, we were freaks, we were outcasts, you know. Uh, matter of fact, I, I was arrested many times for not having the three articles of clothing on. But uh, the police were brutal, you know. Uh, it, was, it was hard, you know, but this was, the village was our home, you know. It was like as long as we stayed together, we were all right. I think people are often shocked to learn that the gay bars were either owned or controlled by the mafia in the 1960s. And that was because it was illegal to serve homosexuals alcohol. There was no law that said explicitly you couldn't serve homosexuals alcohol. But there was a law put in place after prohibition that said you couldn't serve people who were disorderly. The word disorderly was used to impose a ban on, on serving alcohol to homosexuals. So if you're a bar owner, you're not gonna serve alcohol to homosexuals, a legitimate bar owner. So that left a wide open space for organized crime. And so they came to own and control the gay bars in New York City. So there was a whole ecosystem that grew up around the illegal gay bars, where the mafia paid off the police, the police protected the bars, and the politicians who wanted to periodically clean up New York 
would send the police in to raid the bars, close them down, arrest the managers, arrest people who weren't dressed appropriately, and then the bars would reopen the next day with, with new liquor and, um, and maybe even a new name. So a lot of us uh, got jobs uh, on McDougal, on Bleecker, you know, busing tables, you know, cleaning up after the people left from the restaurants. Uh, and I got a job with the mafia. You know, they had a pizzeria on uh, McDougal and Bleecker, and I got a job with them, and, and this guy liked me, you know, for some reason. Maybe he thought, you know, I was a kid, and, you know, he wanted to help. Uh, and he had a bar. Uh, well, first I started running numbers for him, you know, uh, and eventually he opened up a bar here on Barrow Street, uh, called the Bohemia Cafe, and he gave me a job as a bouncer there. And I was about 16, 17 years old, uh, so I made my living that way. But we, we made our living, every, you know, prostitution, robbing stores, uh, you know, you name it, you know, we, we were trying to survive on the streets. There was no, there were no organizations to help us, you know. Uh, Queerness was uh, something to be put down on, so nobody really wanted to help us except our own community at times, you know. But there was nothing out here. No, there was nobody to help us, you know. So we made the best of what we could do, whether it was crime or legit legitimate stuff, you know. But uh, we survived. Some of the mafia were gay, you know, but they couldn't be out about it. But the community knew which ones, you know. Uh, they were all right with us. They gave us jobs. They gave us a place to go to. They charged a lot of money, you know, back in those days. But uh, it was a safety place for us. We could go into these, these places. We could dance. We could drink together. We could, you know, have conversations. You know, we couldn't go into coffee shops as, as a group of queers, you know. We couldn't stand on corners as a group of queers, you know, and, and, and hang around. You know, we were always being chased or harassed and beat up or arrested, you know, and all of these things. So these bars that the mafia ran were escape places for us where we could be, be ourselves. We could dress the way we wanted to dress, dance with each other, you know. Uh, so, it, you know, they gave us, you know, even though it's the mafia and they charged us a whole lot of money and, you know, everything else, it gave us a safe space. You know, and we're thankful for that. I, at least I am. You know, I had a place to go. The bottom line about LGBTQ people was that they really just wanted to live their lives. But the government made that very difficult. In 1953, President Eisenhower signed an executive order barring gay people from federal employment. So thousands of people lost their jobs. Many people killed themselves because they couldn't get jobs again after that. So as the, as the pressure grew on gay people, gay people organized. So the first organization was founded in 1950. And one of the, the challenges they faced in the early days was that the police entrapped gay men in particular. So they would, they would it's a little hard to imagine now, but they would find ways of, go, they'd, go, they'd go to gay bars, they'd go to gay beaches where there were gay people, and they would get gay men to say something or do something that would suggest that they were trying to solicit them for sex and arrest them. Oh, well. Beating up gays was a city sport. I mean, you could always tell the police officer, you know, you're gay, and he came on to me. It was never, well, I remember the first incident I had where I heard someone, I was in Central Park in the evening, I'm not too deeply in, but I heard a horrifying cry. And I came out, and the police were on the corner, and I told the police, and they turned it on me. And uh, they had all the police together, say, he's got a queer story, he heard something in the park. Like, we deserve what we get with the Twilight people, and nobody cares. They didn't care. They put me under the third degree. So I knew right then and there, I was 15, never say a word again. And I understood what people were talking about. Um, so the early gay rights organizations, the, the, the Manishing Society was very involved in trying to prevent entrapment, and when gay men were entrapped, to get them out of jail. Um, so the first organization was founded in 1950 by five guys in Los Angeles. The second organization was founded in San Francisco by a group of lesbian couples. It's called the Daughters of Belitis. So it wasn't a movement in the way that we came to think of it later. Um, it was only a relative handful of people who were involved. Their goals were very modest for the most part, to get the police off the backs of gay people, 
for lesbians in particular to find a way for people to fit in and actually be able to have jobs and work because so often gay people, at least gay people who were visibly gay, at least this, the, in the way that we think of gay people stereotypically, often had difficulty getting work. Maddie Sheen is, a, was court justice back in the day when they had noblemen. You couldn't go in and say the king was sleeping with a different woman or you couldn't make jokes about, you know, the corruption or whatever was going on as gossip. But the court jester, the Mattachine, could come in and say a clever joke, which the whole, everyone would laugh at because it was like telling the truth, but doing it in a way that wouldn't get your, your head chopped off or yourself hung. And that's, that's where the name Mattachine comes from. Jesters who dare to speak the truth. Stonewall was not the first uprising for the LGBTQ community. Um, there had been different uprisings um, that were kind of spontaneous, like Stonewall, that happened before that. There were also organized um, events that happened, like Julius's Sip-In. Julius's um, bar is just a few blocks from here. And so they actually went with a photographer to the bar um, the Mattachine Society, which was actually housed out of one of the buildings right by Stonewall, right here on Christopher Street. Um, and they took a photographer with them and openly declared that they were homosexuals um, because at that time, New York City, the liquor license, you couldn't get a liquor license in New York City um, if you served openly to homosexuals. So to kind of fight against that, they actually would go from bar to bar to bar, um, openly announcing it and taking photographs to hopefully get media attention for it. Um, and Julius's bar, just a few blocks from here, they refused to serve them. And so, uh, you know, the photographer took photos and it actually helped to overturn that law, which was one of the first victories for the LGBTQ community right here in New York. Um, there was also Cooper's Donuts. Um, there were a bunch of different uprisings that happened. LGBTQ history has always been a part of American history. It's just that it's been hidden or it hasn't been explored. So when I went to school um, in New York City, we learned American history. But we, we didn't learn anything related to LGBTQ history that was a part of the American story. And I can give you examples of, of the kinds of things that were missing. So when I was in school, I learned about the Black Civil Rights Movement. I learned about Dr. Martin Luther King. I learned about the 1963 March on Washington. But I never heard of a man named Bayard Rustin, who was Dr. King's chief mentor and also the principal architect of the 1963 March on Washington. And the reason I didn't hear about him was because he was openly gay at a time when nobody was openly gay. He was thrown out of the Black Civil Rights Movement twice and found his way back and became one of the most important people in the movement. But we were never taught about him because of who he was. And the story is really interesting because the FBI tried to get, tried to discredit the March on Washington by spreading rumors that Dr. King was having an affair with Bayard Rustin. Now, as a, an eighth or 11th grader, when American history is taught, I would have loved hearing that story, but that story is not taught. And if you ask most high school students today, they never hear about who Bayard Rustin was. And so when I came on, the lead ranger, Jamie, was asking me if I knew what Stonewall was. I'm not from New York, um, so I didn't. No, it's not really taught in schools, LGBTQ history. As I've come to understand from my work, when we look at history, we tend to look at history through our personal lens, a contemporary lens. And we don't take into account what the conditions were like on the ground for the people who were living that history way back in 1950 or 1955 when the first gay rights organizations were formed. We call them gay rights organizations. They didn't call themselves that. We call it a movement. They didn't call themselves that. It was a very modest effort. And until 1969, or I should say by 1969, there were maybe 40 to 60 homophile organizations with maybe 400 activists. They had to worry about being arrested by the police. They had to worry about their jobs and possibility, the possibility of being thrown out of their homes. It was a dangerous time in which to operate. And they had no reason to believe that the world would ever be a comfortable place to do what the Gay Activist Alliance and the Gay Liberation Front did in the early 1970s. If you were attacked on the street, you could actually find no help. No help. If the attack actually occurred, if it was a ward off by a whole group of people. And now, gays help each other. And uh, that's an amazing thing. Because when you're tortured like that, they tortured us. 
the church and every institution and everything along the way. They taught mythology, they couldn't mention gay people. They taught ancient Greece, they couldn't mention gay people. There was a vacuum that had to be, and science hates a vacuum. And we would fill it ourselves. We'd go to the library, we'd find out. There was a whole grapevine of our own history. Everybody has a history. Nobody forgets. Not the important things, the spirit. And, and so I think there was only so far they could go. We had saw the black liberation. We had volunteered to help black liberation. We had volunteered to help women. And we finally realized, hey, why don't we help ourselves? And we did. So one of the early landmark cases in the late 1950s was uh, it concerned a magazine called One Magazine and what could be sent through the mails. Um, post office regulations uh, made it illegal to send anything through the mail that was deemed uh, obscene. And gay people were deemed obscene by nature. So that if you sent a letter through the mail in which you talked about, uh, a, and you were a woman talking about a girlfriend, or you were a guy and were writing about your boyfriend, and someone got a hold of that letter and turned it over to the postmaster general, you could be arrested for sending pornography through the mail, obscene material. So when this one particular issue of one magazine was sent out, um, and they sent it out from various points, they, they put it in mailboxes all over so Southern California, what the post office did was impound all of these magazines and stored them in a warehouse. And they did that by claiming that the, that the postage was just under the legal amount. So the, the US Postal Service was harassing this early gay rights group that was sending out a magazine that by today's standards, we would say was very benign. Um, but they were also poking fun at J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI in those days um, to try to get attention. And um, so it was, in some ways, it wasn't a surprise that the government went after them. But the case was, there was a case brought that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that we can mark as, I think it was 1959, as the beginning of when it was permissible to mail material through the U.S. Po uh, Postal Service that contained discussion of homosexuality. Well, the Stonewall was really the moment that a small movement became a large movement. I joined Mattachine in 1958. They had 16 members in New York City. People made fun of me for being in the Mattachine Society. People did not want to join an organization because they didn't want to be associated with that masculine lesbian or that that trans person or, you know, some, somebody who was more feminine than they were. They felt that as long as everyone thought all homosexuals were, were the stereotype, that they, they were safe in their own lives. And I think that finally over the decade before Stonewall, Mattachine kept raising the issue of getting on, I was the first one on radio, the first one on TV without a mask, asking questions that people phoned in and whatever. And this caused a, a very positive question went from how can we cure them? They're all sick. They're all degenerates. They're all morally corrupt to are they sick or aren't they? And so once you started getting a public debate and then I found out as a young gay activist in the 60s before Stonewall, if you go out to a civic group and present the argument that we are a, a group, a minority group, and you know, by the definition of minority group, if one person does something bad, everyone's blamed for it. Like two guys run off to Russia as spies and all homosexuals are spies. That kind of stuff went on all during the 60s. And finally, I think homosexuals started getting a better sense of self-worth. So finally, when this was the last dancing bar in New York City and they shut it down, I think they finally had reached the point where we're tired of taking this anymore. And especially here in the village with all this central hub of gay life. Because being LGBTQ at this time was illegal, um, it was a criminal activity, especially being served alcohol at bars, uh, you would also be discriminated against um, in your normal everyday life and at work as well, and you could be arrested. So many people of your LGBTQ would gather at the Stonewall Inn um, to be with their friends and their loved ones and celebrate together and just talk about life. By the time of the Stonewall Uprising, the Stonewall Inn was a bar that attracted a very eclectic crowd, from street kids to drag queens, to guys in sweaters and button-down shirts, sometimes guys in suits. So it was a really mixed crowd. Inside the bar, it was very balkanized. So you had one group at the bar, you had another group, another group in the back of the jukebox, um, and people didn't necessarily mix, but they were in the same place. Stonewall wasn't the only bar for gay people in the village. There were all different kinds of bars, 
But Stonewall was a place where gay people could dance. And that was an exceptional place in the gay bar ecosphere of Greenwich Village in 1969. The Stonewall Inn was kind of a very precious site for a lot of the LGBTQ community. It was really unique because at the time, a lot of the other gay bars didn't allow you to dance together um, because they thought that would bring a lot of attention and that they would end up getting shut down. But the Stonewall did allow that. Um, so this was a really unique spot. Whenever I could get in, like on the weekend, whenever the crowd decided we wanted to do it. Sometimes there were people that were fun, we knew we were gonna be in there, we'd go. Sometimes, no. And you couldn't always get in. There was someone at the door that would let you in or not let you in. They had their reasons for this. I did go to Stonewall. Uh, didn't dance too much. It wasn't such a great dance, though, you know. Slow dance here with the girls. But uh, drinking, definitely. Uh, and Stonewall was a dive. <laughs> you know, I, I can't uh, say it any nicely. You know, it was a dive. Uh, you never bought any mixed drinks there. You know, you bought your own because the, hard, the water hardly ever worked, you know, so they'd be washing the glasses in dirty water, <laughs> you know? So you bought no, no mixed drinks. You bought your own or you bought a bottle of beer, man, <laughs> you know? Uh, but, it, you know, it was a place, you know, it, it's smaller now, you know, back then it had the other part to it. So when you walked in, you could go through this little alcove and there was another big room there, you know? And that's where most of us hung, you know, in those back rooms. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a great place, you know, the music was kicking, people were happy, we were dancing, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was good, it was good, except when the cops came to, you know, uh, raid the places. <laughs> in 1969, what happened in 1969? The myth is that Judy Garland was uptown and she was, it was her viewing uptown and um, everyone was depressed. Judy Garland is like the Madonna or the Lady Gaga of today. She was a major icon in the gay community. And the myth is that they were depressed and the cops came in to harass, to arrest, and they fought back for the first time. They fought back for their right, for their right to love, the right to be who they wanna be. The reason why there isn't many pictures of the, the, the riots and, and, and a lot about it is because no one wanted to be outed. Because in that time, you could lose your friends, you could lose your family, you could lose your job, and you might even lose your life for being homosexual. A whole different time where the younger generation, our generation of today, they don't really realize that. What those people did to fight back for their right to love and to be who they want to be. That night, um, there was no warning. And the police come in and all the lights go on. Um, they start arresting all of the bar staff because it was illegal to serve alcohol to homosexuals. I think there's many myths and legends about who actually started the riots. And the truth is we'll probably never know. Um, a popular kind of myth or urban legend is that Marsha P. Johnson um, threw a brick. Um, we actually know, uh, according to an interview she did with uh, Eric Marcus from Making Gay History, uh, that no brick was thrown and she actually showed up a little bit later um, that evening. Um, so she actually didn't start it, but she was instrumental in the gay rights movement and actually was part of the riot and instrumental in that, but did not start the riot. And I don't think we'll probably ever know who did. Well, we, there are a lot of myths going around, and a lot of people want to say that she and Sylvia Rivera started the movement, that she threw a shot glass into the window, and they called that the shot glass heard around the world. Actually, that turned out not to be the case. Because somebody had a tape made of her when they were interviewing me, where she said she got down to Stonewall when the fire was, still, was just going in the bar. So that would have made her an hour or two after the thing really started arriving here. But she got totally involved in it. And the important thing is that she joined the protest and she kept promoting the protest and the idea that gay people have to unite, like she's famously saying, I got my civil rights at Stonewall. And that's exactly what the gay movement has done. Essentially, the gay movement copied the techniques of nonviolence from the civil rights movement 
And that's what ultimately enabled us to advance much further, actually, than the civil rights movement has worked for other minorities. On the early morning of June 28th, 1969, the police come and raid, and the management at the Stonewall Inn was not aware uh, that this was going to take place. And everyone's pretty shocked, and the police start arresting individuals, and they tell the people that they are not arresting to either disperse and go home. Instead, though, they're concerned about what's going to happen to their friends and loved ones, so the individuals start gathering outside and here at this park across the street, um, they want to know what's going to happen if they're going to be arrested. And they see the police officers gathering their friends and loved ones and putting them in the paddy wagons to be taken to the police station. And they progressively become more and more and more upset about what is happening. And this will end up leading to an outbreak of rioting taking place. And the police and the rioters will go all throughout this area. Um, throughout the streets, rioting for roughly a week. Well, the night it happened, um, my friends and I were going to go to Stonewall. And uh, around 11 o'clock we went and we couldn't get, well, a friend of mine couldn't get in. And he was our type of uh, scared drag queens type. And he said, you're not getting in, because he couldn't get in. Because they didn't want the bar to tip to any one group. If loud, loud queens came too many, they would stop it because the bar could tip. They wanted to keep it mixed, which was really better for the bar, and also because they wanted to make money. So he was saying that, and there was a big rumble down here. I was up further on a stoop. And people passed, he was saying something about a raid. And then me and my friend looked, and we saw, indeed, something was happening. And in those days, it wasn't unusual. What you did when you heard about a raid, if you weren't in the bar, you'd go and see how they brought people out. And so what happened was we went and we saw the drag queens come out to cheers and uh, other people come out that were ashamed and the whole panoply of what happened. And it was like every other night. And I remember passing this paddy wagon and as I looked to the doors, this queen kicked the policeman in the shoulder and pushed him back. He jumped up and ran in and started beating that queen because you could hear the muscle and bone against the tin of the, uh, of the truck. And the car sped away and he looked at us and he said, all right, now get the hell out of here. You saw the game, get out. And for the first time we didn't. And we all found ourselves marching towards him. And I could see the hairs being raised on his neck. And when he turned around, I don't know what we looked like, but I know he saw what we looked like and he ran for the bar and in my section, the riot broke out. And police provocation was enough in every other section, a very small epitheater, to break out. It was just, they meant a showdown, a scene, and they got it. They started fighting back, and the police were not quick to get, uh, to get reinforcements because the local precinct had been paid off. And I know cops that were on patrol in Brooklyn those nights, and they laughed, they said, what, the cops said, I, Officers in the village can't even control, you know, the fags are getting totally out of hand. And I think that that, that that created a spark. Someone told me he was watching the crowd and things were getting a little raucous, but somebody threw a bottle and the bottle broke on the wall behind the policeman who was standing there like that. And the policeman jumped like that. And they saw that it, it, it combobbled or, you know, disoriented the policeman, this breaking bottle. And that's when they started picking up and throwing pennies and stones and small rocks. And that started a riot. And because Mayor Lindsay was mayor, uh, the police were on their best behavior. So when the girls would have chorus lines saying, we are the Stonewall girls, we wear our hair in curls and kick up their feet, the police would advance towards them. They wouldn't advance towards them breaking their heads open with billy cups because they were under the public eye at that time. A lot of the park youth here in the park um, was a lot of LGBTQ youth who were homeless, who were forced to run away, um, who were kicked out of their house and had nowhere else to go. This was kind of a safe haven for them. And so when they started, the police started to actually bring out people who were being arrested. Um, some people were trying to make a joke out of it. Um, you know, they were kind of dancing around, um, but it was still really tense. And when a lesbian was being wrestled to the ground, she yelled to the crowd that had formed outside, like, why aren't you guys doing something? 
and it kind of really sparked the whole beginning of the riots. Um, and people started throwing things. They started forming together. Um, and there were only a few police at that time because this was very routine and there, they didn't face a lot of resistance at most of the um, raids that they would do. And so when the crowd, which had been forming to large numbers, started pushing back against them, um, they actually were pushed back into the bar and they barricaded themselves. And so the crowd outside just kept growing and growing. So they had to get the tactical police to come in. And so when they got here, they started forming lines. But again, there was a really large crowd outside. It was probably close to a few hundred at that point, which was one of the largest um, in the history for uprisings in the LGBTQ community. And so they started pushing back against them. And they were, run, you know, the police were trying to run them down the street, but the streets here are like mazes. They're not like the rest of the city where you can easily just turn around and come back. Um, and so the people here, they knew the streets better than the police did. So they were easily able to just come back around and continue fighting. Um, and so that basically happened. It was a full blown riot at that point. And it went till about 4.30 in the morning when police, neighbors, everyone who was rioting, just everyone was tired. You know, it was like any other day for us, you know, homeless kids, you know, uh, Washington Square Park, scrounging money up, you know, get our drugs, get our alcohol, you know, hang around the park. Uh, it, was a, it was a normal day for us, you know, and the cops didn't hardly bother us in, in Washington Square Park, you know, they just left us alone. You know, maybe there was too many of us, <laughs> you know, but uh, they hardly ever chased us out of that park. Uh, at nighttime, you know, we all slept on the benches or in the grass behind the bushes and everything. And I guess it was about, I don't know, two in the morning, three in the morning, uh, word started coming through, you know. We didn't have cell phones back then, you know, but word of mouth in, in the West Village was just like having a cell phone. You know, I mean, it spread throughout the village, you know, and it got down to Washington Square Park saying, you know, hey, there's something going on at Stonewall, you know, uh, and we all got up and started coming up and we came up this block here, I think it's Waverly, and came up and I was about, oh, where that tree is over there, I know you can't see it. <laughs> Across from, across from Stonewall. So when, when, we, when we got here, when I got here, it was in full blast already. You know, people were screaming and throwing stuff and the cops were here and the folks had already been arrested, you know, and they were starting to chase people down towards Greenwich Avenue where the women's prison was, right? And uh, my friend Martin, who I, you're interviewing later, was telling me that he was on that corner down there. The cops chasing us down the block. And when I say us, I mean community, right? I wasn't in that part, but I could see that they were moving them down towards the avenue. And a lot of people were coming around that small building, right? It's the infirmary, infirmary. And so it was us, the cops and us, you know, and they went into a panic again, you know, and uh, they called the, the tactical police force. So my friend Martin was saying that they came with uh, shotguns, you know, and were pointing them at people. Uh, but while, we, while I was in front of Stonewall, you know, people were screaming and yelling and it was just a, it was just a great time, you know, because we were able to stand up to these cops, you know, and tell them that there was, you know, that they were assholes, <laughs> you know, for arresting us all the time, for beating us up all the time. You know, uh, I do want to make the point that, you know, I know the books and the movies depict uh, a lot of white people, you know, and I was there that first night. And I want to just say, that's not how it looked to me. You know, there were trans people out there. There were people of color out there. You know, there were homeless people out there, drug addicts, straight people, kids. The Black Panthers were out there. Uh, the Vietnam War protesters were out there. It was, everybody was out there and every shade of people were out there. You know, so don't let the movies and the books fool you. We were all out here together. And, you know, I say that for that one moment in time, you know, even though, you know, a lot of us th that were here didn't get along with each other, different fractions of us. For that one moment in time, we came together to tell the police, stop it. Stop harassing us. Stop beating us up. Stop putting us in jail. It has to stop. 
And for that brief moment, it was like everybody was on the same page to tell them to stop. The community started it. <laughs> Seriously. We really think it was a collective. And, and we've been lucky enough to talk to historians and we've talked to people, Stonewall veterans and people that were there. And what, from what we've heard, it was kind of like, it was, it was black trans women of color. It was LGBTQ homeless youth. It was white gay men. It was lesbians. It really was a collective. It was straight allies who poured into the street. It really was everyone who started the riots. What we do know is that the night that the police came in and, ri and, and, and arrested people, that they had to barricade themselves in the bar here, because outside Sheraton Square was a very, very heavy uh, uh, populated uh, gay community. So people heard things were going on at the Stonewall. They're looking out their window and they're seeing, oh, so they all came down. And before you knew it, there was like a thousand people out here riding or uh, fighting back or, you know, protecting the community. And the cops had to barricade themselves inside here. Well, they locked themselves into the bar and uh, people started going crazy. I mean, they started throwing pennies, because they were coppers, they were called. But it got out of hand. Uh, everybody had a long list in their minds of people that were arrested by the police or beaten by the police or notified their parents that the, the police had notified. So everybody had a casualty list in our head that we didn't talk about, but it was there. And the hatred against us just, it was too much to bear. I guess everybody at the same time had, this is enough. I mean, they come in the middle of Greenwich Village to raid a bar that we really, really liked because it was a dancing bar, the only dancing bar we had. It was like being raped. It was just too much. And people reacted that way. And the whole thing that we knew to do was to keep the riot going. Somehow, there was a sense that that was important. Some of the days were really quiet. Some of them were a lot more violent. And we could sense that they were determined to stop it. But we knew the area the way the Mohawks and Indians knew their forests. The police did not know it the way we did it. So we were able to keep the riot going by causing the police to go down one block and we could turn and come behind them. They were really sharp. It became a game, semi-deadly, but nonetheless one that we knew we were winning, or at least we had a chance. And this was the first time in, since Thebes had defeated Sparta that a group of gay men together, a band of brothers, had fought. And all that power, it was there. And all that common sense of democratic leadership and democratic participation was there. I mean, the straight people were brought out of the riot because it wasn't against them, it was against the police. There was a lot of common sense in the riot, more than any I've seen. It's not the first riot I'd seen in New York, but it's the first riot I'd been in. And I didn't know if it was a success or not, but it, it, it's led to what we have today. Some organizations like the Mattachine Society, which were a little bit more conservative, they wanted basically to try to be like, oh, we're just like everybody else. Like we fit in, look how like respectable we are. Um, and other, out of this comes a bunch of other leaders that are like, no, we need to keep this fighting happening because the fighting is what's actually working. Um, so they go and they make copies of different little flyers and they basically call people to come back to the streets. This is one of the largest riots because the next few nights there are hundreds of people that show up. Um, and before that, you know, maybe a hundred people had gone to these different protests or uprisings. Um, but this was by far one of the longest and had the most uh, representative group available um, that came <laughs> that came to protest. Before Stonewall, in two decades, beginning in 1949, we only had maybe a dozen groups, and there were no more than three or 400 activists in the whole country. But with Stonewall, suddenly that just exploded. I mean, uh, you started having gang liberation groups in every city of the country. G GAA 
came out of GLF and they went all over the country to go to gay bar and find people who were interested in organizing a group in their city. So it was really a moment that a very tiny, uh, tiny group of people, it's sort of like the revolution cometh, the people that, that preach the revolution and say, this is what we want. That's what the Manichines did. What do you want? We want to be equal under the law. We don't want to have our sexual, ourselves criminals because of what we do in bed. We want the right of privacy. We, don't, we want to be able to go out and get a job like anybody else. We don't want to be physically attacked on the streets. Just civil rights that everyone else wants. And I think that once that litany got written out, it, it was sort of the platform that these people had to grab onto because we had thought through all the issues and argued all the issues by that time. Oh, there was a complete competence. There was an understanding. It went beyond ourselves. I remember coming down the street. I lived on New Yorkville. And uh, there was a sanitation man. He looked very mean. And uh, he just looked at me. He was throwing bags of garbage into the truck. He just stared at me. I was very sorry I didn't cross the street. But no, he raised his fist in a salute because a lot of people knew we were that oppressed. You didn't know who was going to be on your side. But there were people whose minds were free. My father was one of them. My father said it's about trying you people did something. And he was a cab driver. He watched for decades this kind of cruelty. Now his son was going to suffer it. It was, but he didn't ever advise me to do anything. But he was glad what was done. But I knew there was going to be a lot of struggle. The shift was like, you know, individual shifts. And uh, first time collective pride. But that had to be tried out. This was uh, uh, something we were unused to. It had to be lived day by day. And, was it real? And, and how far did it go? And how much were they going to take? And how much were we going to compress? It was all that kind of stuff. And uh, like any kind of, it was a trial and error. And the gays did very well, I think. With them. They were very nice people. They were respectful people. And uh, they didn't intrude on others. And I thought people appreciated that. It started to come around. Of course, it was big problems. AIDS came and terrible problems. But those only tried people to the extent that now we are a people. And that's what Stonewall started, or Stonewall was a spark or the spark for what was happening already. Well, what it meant for me was a little bit of freedom though that, that night, you know? It was, I could, you know, yell and get back at the cops and for all the things that they've done to me. You know, most of my ribs are broken because of the police, you know? Uh, so it was a chance for me to get back at them that night, you know, and yell and throw things and, uh, for the community, I think uh, we stood on our feet. We were proud, you know. Uh, pride started, I think, that night. You know, we all stood up together. And it didn't matter whether you were trans or lesbian or uh, a gay man or butch femme. It, it didn't matter. We all stood up together, you know, and said, no, it's going to stop, you know. And I think that's where our pride really started. It's, uh, those nights. So a year later, they organized a march to take place to celebrate and commemorate uh, what took place here at Stonewall Inn. And this march, they're really concerned about how it's going to go. Uh, they're not sure if they'll even be able to finish. And um, so they start marching uh, a few blocks from here and they march all the way up to Central Park. And they're really concerned if they'll even be able to finish this march. Because again, it is illegal to be LGBTQ and be openly practicing in the streets. Like they're worried about holding hands, how that will be perceived. And the police are lined up. And they're not sure how people walking on the streets will react to this. And by the time they end this march, there are thousands of individuals gathered at Central Park who joined them on their march. And this is viewed as a catalyst moment for today's modern LGBTQ movement. I, I think after the riots in 1969, yeah, the, the um, it really sparked the revolution around the country. The, uh, the following riots. year, there was hundreds of I organizations that popped up. That, that, so that really it, inspired it everyone so to start well becoming known. activists and it's active in the community and active in this media. fight. So the riots so really sparked television. everyone and sparked all these the organizations across the country to come out area. and say, we're here, we're here, get used to it. It was shown throughout the country or what's going on. So people in Nebraska, Kansas, oh my God, I'm not alone. There are other people like me. And also for the straight allies, they were on camera saying, yes, you know, fighting for gay rights, um, which didn't really ever happen. 
So with all this, I think that's why Stonewall is so important. So one of the things that we heard from people was where they were when they heard about the, the uprising. It was covered in the media and um, people would explain that it was the same way that people talk about where they were when they heard that President Kennedy had been had been shot. And so people would tell us their stories of, of where they were at that moment. And one of the most poignant stories came from Janet Weinberg, who was a teenager in 1969. And she heard the story on the radio of police being fought back at a bar that served people who were uh, in relationships with people of the same gender. And it was the first time in her life when she realized that there were other people like her in the world that loved people of the same gender. And she said it was a life-changing experience for her to listen to the radio in her bedroom and learn this for the first time in her life. You can't discount the importance of the Stonewall riots. That, that really, b because it got national coverage in the news, it really allowed folks across the country to realize that there were LGBTQ people out there who demanded to be seen, to be heard, and to be given rights, basic human rights. And it, it really threw off this whole movement. Um, so many groups evolved out of that. And I think during that time period, you also have to remember there was so much civil unrest in the 60s going on in the United States of America. Uh, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, protests against the Vietnam War. So I think the riots really kind of occurred because it, they were just tired of being oppressed um, during that time period especially. And they were seeing that there were so much other kind of movements that were happening and being successful. So I think they really wanted to stand up and fight back because they were tired of being oppressed. Um, and I think our job as current owners and keepers of history of the Stonewall Inn is to take that legacy and spread it to the places, faces, and spaces that need it the most and places around the world that are still waiting for their Stonewall moment. This was the place where the modern movement for LGBTQ rights really started. And the, the uprising for the, that week in 1969 really spurred the, the galvanizing of the movement for all of what we have now in terms of marriage rights and equality. And it, it also played a role in the, in the fight during AIDS. When we look back at the history of Stonewall and what happened here, it's really important to think about the context. The uprising in the streets of Greenwich Village took place at a time of, of great tumult in the US. You had the women's movement, the black civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, they were often confrontations with the police. And gay people didn't live in isolation. They saw what was going on elsewhere and took inspiration from those other movements, those other confrontations with the police. Um, so the Stonewall Uprising, in the context of history, wasn't a singular event. What, it made, what made it singular was that instead of running from the police, which gay people often did, the police were chased by gay people. They were chased mostly by these young kids. Um, and that scared the police and empowered gay people. And I think we understand um, here at the Stonewall Inn that legacy and the responsibility of that legacy. That's why we started our own nonprofit in 2017, the Stonewall Gives Back Initiative, because again, we understand it's not just a bar. It really is something that represents that movement. And to utilize this particular bar as that global platform to keep that fight alive of everything that started yeah. here in 1969. The Stonewall Inn Gives Back Initiative is the official nonprofit for the Stonewall Inn and only. <laughs> so just so you know that. I also, also, Stonewall to me means strength in numbers. Every time you put a rock on that wall, we become stronger and stronger and stronger. Then we were also fortunate enough um, to work with the Parks Department and other stakeholders when they were discussing making the National Monument. Um, we got a tour with Secretary then Jewell, who was the Secretary of Interior, and we toured her around the space when they were looking at um, you know, historical LGBTQ sites to make into monuments. Um, and then working with um, other different stakeholders, local officials, national officials, um, to kind of make you know, the Stonewall Monument out front of the area here in the park across the street. Um, so for us, that was a, a, an overwhelmingly positive experience and probably something we'll never forget. I was in a meeting and I heard about the study, the LGBTQ study, and then I heard that there was an advocacy group who was 
pushing for President Obama to establish Stonewall as a national monument. So I was asked to be on a committee and there was a lot of background information that I had to perform in order to get the information. We had to do some research. There's also um, some budgeting that we had to create and establish. And then I finally got the call that Stonewall National Monument was going to be proclaimed by President Obama. And then actually when we found out that the monument was going to happen, um, I remember being in my home and getting a call from the White House and we had an LGBTQ liaison and my first reaction was, wait, I didn't even know we had an LGBTQ liaison. Uh, but it was an overwhelming mm -hmm. feeling to think that the, you know, the Obama administration, the President of the United States was actually going to make the Stonewall and what happened here a national monument. And it was such an incredible feeling as, you know, a, a lesbian activist who never thought I would even see LGBTQ marriage pass to have in that moment, that phone call to recognize that my story and my LGBTQ friends and family stories are going to be part of history and national history forever when that monument happened. And also, um, Samantha Power was ambassador to the UN at that time. She her assistant called me up and said, Samantha Powell would like to have a meeting upstairs. Um, we have a downstairs and upstairs. Upstairs and have a UN meeting for the LGBTQ uh, core. So I um, said, sure. She, she came here and with 22 ambassadors throughout the world. And they had a meeting with their little name cards on each table. And at the end, she said, I, I got my picture with her and she sent it to me. And it said, Kurt, today we made history. The only way that the president can proclaim a national monument, the land has to be owned by the federal government. At the time, Christopher Park, which is across the street from the Stonewall Inn, where most of the uprising took place, um, was owned by the city of New York. So there were a lot of mechanisms that we had to go through in order to get that property transferred from the city to the state, to the federal government. And once it was transferred to the federal government, President Obama was able to execute the presidential proclamation. So my involvement with the park actually began in 1994 when I moved to the West Village. And I lived down the block, so I walked past it all the time. And being so close to the park and so close to Stonewall, the momentous occasions that happen that involve the gay community are ones that I hear literally from my bedroom. So when marriage equality was passed in New York State, I heard about it because of the cheering and all the noise that was happening outside of Stonewall before I read about it in the newspaper, even saw it on the news. That's how close and involved it is. Um, my more direct involvement with the park really began in 2013. Because I lived in the neighborhood, I'd seen how the park had really fallen into disrepair. The parks department here doesn't really get enough funding to do high maintenance in all its parks. So the park had really, the, the, the irrigation system had fallen apart, and we really had nothing more than ewes, ivies, and rats in the park. And it just looked really sad. So a number of folks in the community got together. We created the Christopher Park Alliance, and we got together and raised funds to put in new irrigation, all new plants, and really renovated the park. It was really a labor of love. All volunteers, the donations were coming in at 50 or 100 bucks at a time, and we raised like close to $35,000 to renovate the park. We're very proud of that. So when news of this park perhaps becoming a national monument, we were initially a little weary. The idea of having a new landlord, one in Washington, D.C., take over the park for, was a little scary for to us because we just figured out how expected. to work I with the bureaucracy in City Hall background. here in New York City. Um, but after spending a good deal of time with the National Parks Conservation Association, which was leading the charge for this becoming campaign. a park, and the I National Park Service, the well, they want the us over. And, and very quickly, we were on board 110%. It was so important to, uh, for me to, to recognize right off the bat that the same things you do to protect a watershed or a forest or to fight for a clean river are the same campaign techniques that you use 
for fighting for a national monument for a, a critically important historic site. So I moved to the city right as this site was being created as a national monument. And that was an incredible experience to be here. I'm um, seeing everyone celebrating, everyone's so excited. And it had been in the works for a while. And so we all knew that they were hopefully going to be able to create this as a national monument. But just the, like, the joy and the excitement that everyone had, that was such a fun moment to be here for. One of the most important techniques in any campaign is to listen really hard uh, when you're leading a campaign or you're part of a campaign. And the reason for that is that you have to understand the points of view of the people who want the change to happen. You have to understand the points of view of people who don't want the change to happen. And the change in this case is we wanted to make a national monument for Stonewall. And so that listening is really important for campaign techniques and to get them right. But the other thing that is so important about listening and especially for Stonewall is understanding why it meant so much to people and feeling that energy and that passion and that desire for national recognition for a place that was long overdue for national recognition. So I would say that the importance of listening and, and, and matching the passion and the feelings and the anger and the love that people tell you about a place and matching that to excellent campaign techniques that you've also developed by listening really well, that's the kind of the perfect magic sauce for making something like this happen. Stonewall National Monument is a teeny tiny little sliver of land and there's no public restrooms, there's no visitor station, there's no area for our rangers to go out and take a break. So it's not the traditional sense of a national park, but our rangers have adapted to that environment. The opposition had more to do with confusion about what a national monument was. People thought, oh, we might, maybe the Park Service will build a, a visitor center in the middle of beautiful Christopher Park or something like that. Um, people were worried about extra noise or that type of thing. There was, there was, um, there was an issue with the amount of funding that it would take to, to create a new national park. And in, in 2016, we have to remember that the National Park Service budget was extremely tight and the Northeast budget was very, very tight. And so to have a new national park with potentially no, no new funding was, was a major, major concern. And so we had, to work, we had to work for all of that. I'd also say that there was some opposition that we heard, but mostly not in New York, um, but we heard through some media and press that there was just questions of you know, why is something like this needed? This isn't important. This is, this is another stretch of, the, of what the National Park Service is really all about. So we had to work through that. New York is home for me. Um, so I'm very familiar with Christopher Park. Um, I recall even hanging out at Christopher Park as a, a young teenager and as a young adult. So of course I was excited, you know, me being a part of the LGBTQ community, I was excited that we were finally getting um, a, a site in the National Park Service that identified with telling the story of the LGBTQ community. So um, that within itself and to place a very small part in the celebration was uh, very significant for me. We heard during the campaign how personally important Stonewall was to people. People would come up to us when we were here talking about the campaign or doing a press event and pull us aside and say, if you make this happen, this will be such an important thing for me personally because I have fought my whole life to be accepted by my family. I fought my whole life to be understood and to feel good about myself. We heard that over and over again. The other thing that we heard was how Stonewall was so meaningful to many, many people who were born long after Stonewall happened, long after 1969, long after the, the uprising. Um, and it was th th so clear, in which so many people know, that it, the, the symbolism of what happened here, the thing that happened here was a symbol for the need for freedom and liberty and justice and equity and inclusion for all people around the world.
I think the park's legacy is the power of place. Um, it, it, it's just so incredibly fulfilling to come here and see people of all ages, it's not just young people, come in and find a place where they can be recognized. Because in so many parts of the world, if you're LGBTQ, you aren't recognized or you're abused or you suffer in some way just because of who you love. And to be able to come here and find that that is wrong, that you can love, love is love, right? To see it validated here is so important. Um, when the monument first opened, we, we had a table here and we asked people for their comments and, and I still vividly remember this, this one man about my age came up and, and he goes, I only wish my mother could be here because she never understood me. She, she never thought it was right. This says it is right, it's okay. That's the legacy. So for me, this park is sacred grounds. Um, there's a lot of history in this park even before the Stonewall Rides. This was the lands of the Lenape tribe as well. And um, I just it's consider this a very sacred space. Um, it's a safe place, it's a haven for people looking for hope said that to find their way through the storm. Our history, LGBTQ history it also represents a place a where the we can story. honor all because of the elders, did, all of the activists that fought that for our rights. Of the LGBTQ so civil rights it's twofold, it's honoring the, the past story, and giving hope American for the history. future. I think the importance of the statues are that it's the first time people saw in a public space something commemorating that struggle. I mean, we've seen statues for the Civil War, we've seen statues for hundreds of other things, but we've never seen our struggle commemorated in that way. Um, and the fact that the statues are on the ground and that they're approachable said it in, in a way that was so unique. Um, people go up to the statues half the time and they don't really realize that it's a statue for the gay rights movement. And subversively, in a way, that's the point. LGBTQ people are everywhere. And working in the gardens, that was always fun for me to see how people discovered that relationship with the community, with the statue, and what they stood for. The artist is George Siegel, who's known for working in this format where he actually used plaster casts on real people. These are cast in bronze. And then to give them the white look, the white patina, it's actually a very hard wax that uh, he mixes with the magnesium oxide and is applied on the statues. Now then, a lot of folks have wondered, you know, why the white wax? Um, and the rationale the artist gave is that it's like a, a white um, canvas or a screen. It's meant that you can project so any nationality, any look on it. It's uprising, not meant to represent a particular race or creed. It's really point. meant to be a blank really canvas isn't. that you can represent um, any look on it. Um, in the commission, it, it was very clear that it was to represent male and female couples. And after. Um, it's a much bigger just, story you know, than just Stonewall, gay although Stonewall was a key catalyst um, so in the in history that sense, of the gay civil rights movement. And it gave birth to the gay liberation phase of the movement looked at uh, different ideas on how to bring the story to the public and keep them engaged. Um, prior to COVID, um, we were conducting walking tours that actually went through the village and, and, and identified some historical locations that are actually a part of the historical landmark for Stonewall. Um, we have parks and um, park ranges in the park that uh, give tours. Um, we even had a Google project where folks can uh, download an app and actually Q, QR in um, on a code and be able to get some more information related to Stonewall. So there's various ways and creative ways that our rangers try to engage um, and teach educational programs related to Stonewall. For me, putting up these flags is one of the most fulfilling things I've ever been able to do in my life because when people come to this park, I see how much happiness and joy it brings them to be able to feel represented and to feel 
that they have a place where they're honored and they're celebrated. You know, it's, um, it means so much to me. Stonewall and the uprising to me um, is more of a personal connection um, just because it represents who I am as an individual. Um, so to me, the uprising and what Snow and Stonewall um, being designated as a national monument, it's, it's significant to me as women's rights and, and, and the civil rights movement um, because it, it helps identify the, the group of people who have been left out in society for so long. So it's, it's a personal thing, inclusion, liberation. Um, I also think it's a place where young people now can come and hear stories about other people who are just like them. So um, I think it's a liberating um, experience. Um, once you hear the story and you're able to be in Christopher Park, um, even to look at Stonewall Inn, um, I think it, it, it's liberating. Uh, that's what it means to me. I started with the Park Service June 10th of 2016. So all of the Stonewall transferring um, was still very hush-hush. Um, they kind of knew because they were had already been doing this for a few years, talking about it becoming federal and part of the National Park Service. Um, but we didn't actually know, I don't believe, until just a few days before the actual announcement. Hopefully, President Obama was going to announce it very soon. So once they announced it, um, you know, everyone was here, Department of um, Interior, the secretary was here, the director of the Park Service, our superintendent, Shirley, Jamie was lucky enough to be here. Um, and then we were lucky enough to have a bunch of different employees be part of the 2016 Pride March. So there were a bunch of different festivities that went on, um, but that was the first time for Manhattan sites that the National Park Service here in Manhattan was part of the actual Pride March in New York City. And then we've been part of it every year since. I've also been a part of two Pride Marches and I've been able to march in uniform. And that's an incredible experience that marching and having all these people like cheering and we're all out there to uh, share our belief in equality and just really be there for one another. And that's just an amazing experience. I think as an LGBT community, the fact that we actually have a national monument that represents us is critical to the fabric of Americana storytelling and history. Um, and it's so important that um, the Stonewall Monument is there, not only to teach younger generations about the fight that went on in this very bar in 1969, but to remind us of the history of the past to make sure that we can continue to that fight and create a better future. Yeah. And I, I said it before earlier, it's, it's very important that you know your history, especially your gay history. Because if you don't know your history, you might not have a future. They, this generation and generations in the future has to know what these people in 1969 and before did. They fought back for the right to love who they want to love and to be who they want to be or who they are.